in part three of the Offers Dyke video series. We're going to have a look at section C to see what interesting features we can find. The start of section C is fascinating because it changes in direction by 90 degrees. This fact is not lost on Fox, who states it's as though the builder of the dyke, before turning his back on the mountains and making for the Hertfordshire Plain, selected the most commanding position on the march as an angle of the frontier line. It is kept high as it's a gesture of defiance. Of course, this is complete and utter nonsense. So the incomplete gesture was an act of defiance. But not to the Welsh, as they couldn't see it unless they had already invaded through the six mile gap in the south of this hill range. Hill and Worthington were keen to address the Rushrock Hill section because it was pivotal to their argument that Offers Dyke did not run from sea to sea, but from Trendon in Flintshire to here, Rushrock Hill, and no further. Clearly, this section defines any logic when it comes to either a defensive boundary or a marker on the landscape, as it clearly changes at 90 degrees going north-south to east-west. The only way you can rationalise this feature in the landscape is to show what happened with the waters of the Mesolithic and Neolithic period, which changed this hill range into an island surrounded by water. The dike cuts across the hill from the natural harbour in the southeast side of the island and exits to the northeast. Was it a shortcut? Was there something on the island that is yet to be found by archaeologists? Certainly, the additional small shallow ditches to the northeast, which would have been exposed as the waters fell, are of as much later date and specification to the hill ditches. What we do know is that there are several quarries on the line of the dike and that it turns 90 degrees at a point to another earthwork feature at the top of the hill overlooking the valley. It is my guess it's a long barrow or another quarry. The dike now takes to the floodplain of the environment where it becomes very straight for the first time which makes us believe that this is actually an additional part of the dike rather than the original which takes this wibbly wobbly route over hills. This probably is a later addition by the Romans because they reutilized the prehistoric dikes of the past for their own use, particularly if they're exploiting minerals from mines within the hills. This part of the section shows that the dike is completely a different design and specification than the previous section which went through the floodplain and therefore was not built at the same time. Moreover, this section starts in a quarry and ends in a paleo channel after it joins another dike coming out yet another quarry. Another feature I believe associated with the dike is located 300 meters south of the peak of this hill castle ring. The monument comprises the reins of an earthwork enclosure. The date or the precise nature of the closure is unknown to archaeologists, but they reckon it's likely to be either prehistoric or medieval. The problem is there's a massive gap between the two dates. Castle ring also shows it has a close connection to the raised shore levels of the prehistoric and that the dikes were cut from the shoreline of the ditches to the site. Again, we see on this section of the dike that one's dike starts halfway up a hill, which makes no sense at all. Or you could say it stops halfway up a hill. Either way, there must be a reason for this and the only logical explanation is that it starts and finishes on the shorelines of the prehistoric waterways of the past, which means the rivers in those days would be much higher and therefore that would explain why these, this dike starts and stops at such height. 
over hills. As you see in places, our LIDAR map is incomplete. It comes from government sources and we have no control over its publication, distribution or fragmentation due to the lack of data. This is the reason we run side by side the Google Earth map so it shows those blank spaces as a satellite photograph. This short section of Office Night returns to the substantial ditch and bank of previous sections, then quickly to return again to a single bank without reason. The prehistoric shoreline reveals the reason why, as it was a minor hillock in the past, and the dike was a path over the hill. So again, it's questionable if this was actually part of the Office Dike structure. The best way to describe this section is to look at where it starts and where it finishes. It seems that both ends again are unconnected and in the middle of nowhere. Even the most favoured of maps from OS, which has seemed to exaggerate the connections that long ago have now shown to be completely false. What you should notice as we fly over these sections is the litter of quarries and small pits, too numerous to count in fact, that show up as green markers on LiDAR and white patches on GE maps. And it seems that the dike revolves around these quarries as they are in very close proximity to the dikes no doubt being utilised by the dikes as a transportation means of getting the minerals from out the ground to wherever they are traded. Also in this section which is of great interest is the interconnection of other dikes going into the main dike. This is not a single dike going over this section but multiple dikes interconnecting from the highest shorelines of the past. No doubt linking to the quarries within the site and therefore giving multiple outlets for transport of the goods and materials mined in this area. If we look in detail at this and previous sections using LiDAR, we see something very strange. When the builders came to the direction to go over the landscape, they could have taken a completely different route than the one we see today. The alternative route runs high on the top of the hill and avoids going down into the river valley. This would be the logical route for Offers Dyke if it was linked to the traditional explanation of being a defensive or a landmarker. The reality is that the builders needed to add the extra labour of going through the river valley, either as a connection requirement to the river or to find something of value within the many quarries at its base. The dike's function as a canal can be confirmed in this section, for the smoking gun is on the 1800 OS map that shows the dike was built directly above a natural spring. As we have now found in many occasions throughout Britain's dikes. Moreover, beside the dike is a barrow on Hagen Hill. This barrow is isolated and is not placed on top of the hill, but like Offer's dike, two thirds down the hill, a hundred metres from the dike. This would suggest it postdates the dike. Barrow Mound is well defined with dimensions of 22 metres in width and 1.7 metres in height. Historic England suggests that it has a 2 metre ditch surrounding the borough. More dating evidence for the dike can be found on this section on an ancient trackway called Kerry Ridgeway. Conclusive evidence can easily be seen on our high resolution LiDAR maps of this area. This shows that Kerry Ridgeway cutting through the dike, now with a modern road sitting upon it. However, 
Closer inspection shows that the ancient pathway must have crossed at the same height as the ditch, as shown as green on the LIDAR. This would indicate that the dike must have been constructed before the ancient trackway. Confused? Let me explain. If the ancient path was older than the dike, the dike would have destroyed it or stopped it by leaving a gap. The pathway, including the modern road, would then be at one level and that would show up as yellow on LiDAR. But it's not. It's deeper at the intersection. The fact the modern road is green at the point of intersection means they must be built after the dike's ditch and therefore it's at the same level as the dike's ditch and therefore the dike must have been there before the road. Further confirmation of sequencing can be found also in a Mott and Bailey found on the line of the dike. In fact, if you look at the 0800 OS map, it is marked as a tumulus and not a castle. This would suggest that it has been misinterpreted and probably a fire beacon for a site on the river. This can be seen in the LIDAR map showing a low mound, the Mott, surrounded by the shorelines of the river which Ofstark disappears within before emerging as a ditch on the other side. This is a classic fire beacon mound. We have found many of these throughout Britain and they were built to attract boats. The Roman camp on the line of the dike that flattens the dike shows it was made in prehistoric times. And the fact that this, the first of Offa's dike is kept straight line leads us to believe that it was utilized by the Romans for their own use. As we have shown with the vallum at Hadrian's Wall, making the idea that Offa's dike was Saxon somewhat redundant. We're now coming to the end of section C, where Office Dyke will disappear for another 8.5 miles. It is very clear, looking at the sections of section C, that Office Dyke is not a singular entity and it's a collection of individual dikes built at individual times. This can be seen very easily at the end of section C as it disappears into what's known as the Devil's Hole, which could be possibly the river at the time or an intersection with other dikes. The Devil's Hole is a dike that goes from the river Clamed and cuts east to west. It certainly connects to Offa's Dike as a termination point. Is it modern? If it is, why would you connect to an old ditch that was not used and dried up? My guess is, as this is the flat surfaces of the riverbed, at this point the dike is incredibly straight, which would suggest it's Roman, and probably the shoreline of the river within the Roman period. This is the end of part three of five. Please come and see me on part four where we continue our investigation in section D to see if there's other interesting aspects which we should know about with Offers Dyke.